grace tonight to have in our midst our techno wizard, uh, Fermilab technician extraordinaire, super smart guy, nice guy, Facebook guru, and the guy that sends out the general emails. So he is tying two flies for us tonight. So this is kind of a bonus deal. And uh, Kyle, we really appreciate you stepping up and jumping in here tonight. So thank you very much. And without further ado, the floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Mark. So our first fly tonight, let me see if I can focus that a little better now. Definitely more wiggly. Uh, that's my hand. Oh, okay. I hope it's my hand. You should have had a cocktail instead of a coffee. There you <laughs> go. That looks good. Now I got to put my set self in the center so uh, my white shirt's on it. Okay. I think it looks better with a darker background, Kyle. I think so. No. Uh, washed out. Okay. Blown yeah. out. Okay, so the first fly tonight is the Rainbow Warrior, tied in pink, uh, on a jig head uh, hook. So, um, my first encounter with the Rainbow Warrior was in uh, the Rockies. So, out there is a pretty prolific fly, typically tied in 18 to 22, very small. And to my surprise, not many fly shops had the jig head version. Um, so the jig head version, I think, is pretty popular, um, but it's the only one I tie around here. Uh, and this has kind of become, in the last year or so, my go-to um, kind of exploratory fly for the Driftless. Um, has kind of replaced the pink squirrel mostly because uh, I find it a little easier to tie. Uh, I think it looks better on a jig head than the pink squirrel. Um, and I often don't have the uh, requisite uh, pink uh, wire for the uh, pink squirrel. So uh, I've gone to this guy. It's very easy to tie. Um, did I mention it yet? This uh, this fly was developed by uh, Lance Egan. If you guys haven't heard of Lance Egan, he is a pretty uh, well-known competitive fly fisherman. Uh, you may know the fly shop that he, I'm not sure if he's an owner or, or affiliated, but he works there. he's part of the, he works there? Okay. Yeah. He's uh, part of the fly fish food guys. Um, you can often hear him talking about uh, his flies and uh, his fly fishing on their podcast, Fly Tying with Uncle Cheech. And uh, of course, they've got the Facebook group and the website and the fly shop online. So if you uh, are curious about it, I think every other podcast, uh, someone asks them about the fly. So he can talk about it pretty often. So the materials are pretty easy. They're pretty simple. Uh, we've got... In this version, we've got, it doesn't work too well, does it? Let me switch up camera. So we've got these uh, Umpqua size 16 competition series, uh, jig head, 60 degree head, uh, barbless. I only tie barbless nowadays. Uh, once you get a barbed fly in your pinky finger and Dutton has to pull it out stream side, you don't tie of barbs anymore. And then for the head, we are using slotted tungsten, size 330 seconds. And this is probably one of the greatest tips I ever got from Dan was at this place, flyshack.com will sell you a hundred fairly decent slotted tungsten beads for about 13 bucks as to as opposed to about eight dollars for 16 of them at a fly shop and they are no different you can get them in any color you want any size you want flyshack.com 
And then we are also using for the body, we're using uh, Vivis. They call it large pearlescent uh, tinsel. It's actually see-through. They call it large, it's about one eighth of an inch. And our tail is, doesn't tail barbs. Oh, and I'll be tying it with red thread. Um, I think the red adds a little bit of a hot spot behind the bead. So enough about the materials. Okay. So first thing you got to do is you got to put the slotted bead on the hook. Okay, and once you got that on there, put it in your vise. Now, if you guys haven't tied with the uh, slotted bead, there's kind of a natural way that it wants to sit. I like to make it so that uh, the slot is facing down. When you say a slotted bead, is it mm -hmm. a split bead or, or nope. is it just like a hunk out of it? Let me see if I can get a picture of it here for you. See that? So okay. instead of the normal uh, larger hole in the back, it actually has like a uh, actual slot out of it. To make the and bend. To make the bend. And then also it kind of rests. Uh, let's see if I can get it again here. It makes it kind of rest in that uh, the jig right there. Thank you. Uh huh. Now it'll become a little bit more stable after we get some thread in there. So I'm using a ADOT uh, Uni Red. I really like the uh, Uni thread. So I'm tying it right behind the jig, eye, jig head. And what I'm going to do is actually run my thread on top of the bead. So I'm creating a thread bump underneath where I will have the bead rest. So now if I press that bead down, it's pretty solid. Actually, I could give it a little bit more. And this just keeps the bead from, I think we used the term wiggling earlier. You don't want it to wiggle. So get a good thread base all the way back to the bend. And then bring your thread back to the hook point. Now get your dozen tail barbs. Cut, I don't know, maybe four to six off. And you might've noticed if you've seen this pattern online I think Lance Egan included. They tie pretty short tails. I typically don't tie short tails. Usually my tails on all my nymphs are at least half the shank, if not longer. I find that they rub off on the rocks and everything anyways, and I feel like it gives me a little bit more time to fly. You look at most aquatic nymphs too, and their tails are very long, much longer than I know. Uh, and a nymph fly too. Yeah, I think it's one of those strange things where aesthetically people like the shorter tails. Yeah, I think it looks nicer. Yeah, it does look nicer, but. but as far as realism goes, it's more, uh, it, it looks more realistic actually with a longer tail. I don't like tie my mouth. I'm wrapping that, wrapping that back down to about the bend. And bring it forward. Cut it off. Now bring that uh, pheasant tail all the way back to the eye because you actually want to build up a little bit of material closer to the eye because you want a tapered body. So next, I'm using that 
Vivas pearl tinsel. Cut off a few inches. With this stuff, I can you see it. With this stuff, I like because it uh, has a lot of memory from the spool. I like to run it a few times on my fingers and heat it up, and it straightens it out a little bit. And kind of angle that at 45 right behind your bead eye. And it's not supposed to spin on you, but mine did. Okay. And wrap that back to your bend. Okay, now advance your thread all the way back to behind the eye, or excuse me, behind the bead. Okay, and now we're going to wrap this tinsel away from you, advancing up. Oh, sorry, I forgot a step. I think I mentioned earlier that you want a slight taper to your body. So here's your chance to do that. Just use your thread, go back to the hook point, back to the uh, bead and create just a slight taper. This is not a bulky fly. In fact, a lot of them I've seen have no taper at all, but I prefer the taper. Okay, so now that you've built your taper a little bit, wrap your tinsel You want to wrap that all the way to the bead. Okay. I don't cut it off yet. You want to then fold that over on the body and bring it back about out there. Get a good thread base. The next thing we're going to do is if you were tying the rainbow version of the Rainbow Warrior, we would get our rainbow dubbing. But I typically use I typically use Ice Dub UV Pink. nice. It's the same stuff I use for my pink squirrels. Well, Kyle, because your mylar is so translucent, mm -hmm. have you ever changed your thread base to get a different effect? I have not. I find that the uh, tinsel, you're wrapping it over itself. You're wrapping about one and a half times over the last wrap. Uh, it's not as see-through as you think. Okay. That's my experience. And I think it's more important to get the thread color that you want for the hot spot. So I typically try to avoid dubbing loops at all costs as I like to put out as many flies in the little amount of time I have to tie. So a little bit of uh, dubbing wax. And then with the, the ice dub stuff, it's actually pretty terrible dubbing in that it doesn't uh, lay very well on the thread. It just looks good. Sorry, you guys probably can't see that, can you? Hmm. Hmm. Very sparse. Don't need a lot.
the ice dub, I like to uh, pull a little bit out. Let's see if I can show this. And then pull it against each other, pull it against itself so that they're all kind of oriented the same way. And then lay that on the thread. Also, because I like a really tight hot spot behind the uh, bead, I typically put a little dubbing wax on my finger when I spin this. And that gives you a very, very tight rib of dubbing here. you get a fairly sizable ball of dubbing there. Go ahead and wrap behind the bead. Pull your dubbing back as you're wrapping around your bead. Do it about three wraps. And then you wanna take that tinsel that you held over. You wanna bring it over the ball of dubbing. Taking the faux wing, go ahead and tie that down. Oh, lost it. And pull it back and put a wrap in front of that. And then you can cut this guy off. And this is not a bad time to get rid of all these stragglers. Just don't cut your thread. You're not tied off yet. And then I like to whip finish. And I don't mind the thread looking kind of bulky because, again, I chose red to kind of give it that hot spot. And I am, I don't know what you guys are using for your uh, head cement, but a few years back, I picked up the stuff from Whitetail. Non-toxic, solvent, fume-free, fly-tying cement, fly light, fly tight. And I love it. It doesn't smell. It works great. Uh, I have this bad habit of wiping off my... Uh, Bodkin on my jeans after each fly, and it hasn't ruined my jeans. So I like to put a dab on there and push it off to each side. And that is the pink version of the Jig Head Rainbow Warrior. Does anybody have any questions? Do you ever change the tailing material? Yes, I actually do. Um, when I am purposely tying it to be a replacement for the pink squirrel, I use a crystal flash. I'm a firm believer on the pink squirrel that the crystal flash catches more fish. I think it's an attractor. Um, so when I'm trying to tie these to replace that, I'll put a crystal flash on it. Okay. Um, and I typically tie those just as long as I tied this and probably about four strands. Do you, do you tie these in multiple sizes and weights or is 16 your preference? I only tie this one in 16. Okay. I don't tie it any larger. Um, the same is true for most of my nymphs in the dripless recently. 
Um, I used to tie a lot of 12 and 14s. And I think my hookup percentage has gone up uh, actually using the smaller fly. And that also kind of began a couple of years ago when out in the Rockies, I was catching fairly large trout on very, very small nymphs and uh, kind of said to myself, why am I throwing size 12 in the driftless? And I think it's done, I think it's done me good. <laughs>